All right, today I wanna to talk about the 2017 Trump tax plan. Now that we're in the year 2019, the 2017 Trump tax cuts don't take effect until 2018. So now that we're in early 2019, we're now gonna submit all the taxes for the year 2018 that are due in April. So some of the more interesting things about the, the Trump tax plans was supposedly it will simplify filing for taxes by removing um, all the deductions. So other than the standard deduction, you're supposed to be able to now just list your income essentially and you don't have to go through the painstaking task of listing all your deductions in order to lower your effective tax rate from from the federal tax tax rate which is as high as 34% for your your average you know median income earner so like in California and in New York you're gonna appear to be making way more money than a lot of the middle red states would where the median income was something like 50 50,000 or something heard it as high as you know 70 or 80 80,000 but in California or New York if you're in like San Francisco Los Angeles San Diego, New York, someplace like that, that is not much money at all. Most people need to be clearing at least ninety to hundred thousand dollars minimum, <laughs> just just to uh, carry on and you know have a house and car and whatever. One hundred and fifty seems to be pretty average, or maybe one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty ish. And then if you had a dual income, then you might be easily able to clear like two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand or so. But that's provided that you're you're talking about a couple of engineers or a doctor lawyer combo or that wouldn't necessarily be like a, uh, a cop and a teacher, <laughs> right? Like a cop and a teacher might be more like 150-ish put together, maybe 170. So if the cop made like 90 grand and depending on how much overtime he does, maybe you'll have like 100 something. Whereas the, the teacher is probably only like 50 to 70,000 provided that she's full time and she's been there for, you know, five or 10 years. So if you put those two numbers together, like it's about 150 or so. Whereas if you had a couple engineers making about somewhere between 120 and 150 a piece you're, you're looking at 300 grand uh, 250 to 300,000 the doctors and the lawyers I don't know <laughs> the the doctors are more easily to calculate I think they're they usually clear 200,000 or so if they're full-time if you have a pair of them then you probably have four to five hundred thousand and if they were doing some sort of like specialty like you know something to do like a dentist that you know specializes in orthopedics or not orthopedics sorry uh, child dentistry I forget what the name of that is. Then yeah, he might be doing three, four, five hundred thousand or something, depending on how many dentists work for him and how many hygienists and whatever. But the, the bigger point is, is that that's what you should be looking at in terms of your professionals, your your construction and restaurant workers and stuff or whatever. I mean, they're they're really struggling <laughs> to, to clear a hundred thousand. But that, that's why California and New York have such high homeless populations as well. At the heart of the city, a lot of people that are doing the professionals, anyways, keep the price of housing fairly high just because they're all competing for the same real estate so it doesn't really matter how much money uh, people make on average what's gonna happen is they'll compete for the real estate and that will drive the cost of the real estate as high as they can afford and then some so really it's about how much can you borrow well, yeah, I think the Fannie and Freddie standard conforming loans top out at somewhere like 720 or 720 thousand something in there so really it's about how much can you borrow and then after that to get a competitive edge on someone the reason why you see like you know uh, houses in the palisades you know easily clear like 1.1 million to 1.5 million to 2 million or so even though these are just old regular houses that just happen to be by the beach it's the fact that they're by the beach and inland and near um, these uh, these profit centers the city or downtown city is why they're so valuable so the house itself is nothing spectacular but if the standard conforming loans top out at seven hundred thousand or so you're gonna need a second mortgage or private money to clear the difference between 720 and a million or 720 and 1.5 million so maybe almost double the cost of the house so where does a lot of that money come from exactly and it turns out it doesn't it's not from the salaries themselves right where the, a lot of the money comes from is oh from inflation <laughs> equity that was uh, gained through previous uh, home ownership or previous properties. So for instance, if you bought a house in Long Beach in the I don't know, before Nixon took us completely off the gold standard in 71 or 72. So let's say that same year you bought a house in Long Beach, you know, you're, you might have bought a house uh, for a grand total of $27,000. Three bed, two bath, 
<laughs> two car garage, you know, house in Long Beach, but it was Long Beach. And then by the end of the 70s, like 79 or so, you could have sold that house for 69, $70,000 or so. So all of a sudden you just found yourself with, you know, about $35,000 of equity that you didn't put in there through sweat and blood and tears or cash, right? That was just pure inflation. So by the time, so if you were to sell that house and move further inland into the like Riverside area or Orange County or wherever, you're gonna walk in there with, you know, $30,000, $40,000. So you might buy a house for $72,000, but the amount of money you actually owe would be more like thirty dollars or $35,000. And then that same house, if you were to give it all the way up until today, 2018, 2019, might be worth, I don't know, six or $700,000. So if you think about that, the equity that people are, sitting on was not earned equity. This is inflation. So the, the joke used to be the California retirement plan was to let the inflation kick in, hold on to the house, make your minimum payments, let that drag out for 10, 20, 30 years, and then move somewhere into the middle states, you know, sell the house, pay whatever money you happen to owe off. Um, so if you had that same house in the 70s for $69,000 and it's worth now six or $700,000 and provided you kept up with the minimum, then you can move to Texas or Colorado or Utah or Nevada, someplace like that with, you know, um, $500,000 in your pocket, maybe $600,000 in your pocket if you hit the whole thing off. And then you could buy whatever you want in those states with the derived equity. Maybe have like a nicer house. It's brand new. It's got all the upgrades, um, premium lots, the whole thing. So this sounds great for people from the 60s, 70s, and 80s that are now, you know, looking to retire. But what about the kids, right? Those same people who had kids in, you know, LA or San Francisco or wherever, or New York, those kids are now trying to compete with people that have, you know, half a million dollars equity in their house due to inflation, but they didn't get the benefit of the inflation. So uh, yeah, some of those kids who grew up in those houses got the benefit of living in the house, but a lot of people who moved here or came from broken homes or orphans or whatever, right? They got zero benefit <laughs> and now they have to compete with, you know, sky high prices and hyper inflated houses. So that $10 an hour, you know, Starbucks job doesn't make that much sense because you're not really even able to pay rent. So if we were in like San Francisco, for instance, and you were worked at a Starbucks or a Pete's Coffee or I'm trying to remember the other one that's uh, Mike's, uh, Mike's Coffee, whatever, and you're only making like 10, 15 bucks an hour, maybe, right? Your your rent is probably like for one flat might be like three grand, maybe four thousand dollars. And if it has four rooms, then you probably divvy that up into you know four micro apartments so you and a bunch of uh, roommates might go grab one of these rooms and you're gonna split the that three or four thousand dollar rent four ways which is sustainable right like you can you can almost do that on 30 grand so fifteen dollars an hour equals about 30 grand under the tax under the tax plan previous and now under trump i think it's you don't have to pay hardly any taxes on that so every dollar you make is being used just to sustain yourself no vacations no investments no fun and that shit gets old fast let me tell you a lot of people who come to san francisco come for jobs or and or school so living like college kids in a dorm with roommates can work for a little while until you graduate college or you get that first job and then you're now somewhere in your middle 20 mid 20s so you're like 25 ish if you're a doctor or lawyer you might still be in school for a couple more years a lot of kids from the 2000 2010 era <laughs> racked up like something anywhere between like 30, 50, 60 thousand dollars of student debt. If you're a doctor or lawyer, it might be like a hundred thousand. Like I know some some people who went for nursing degrees and found that most schools were impacted for nurses during the Great Recession. So they went to private schools to get their RN and some of them are as deep as like 200,000, 300,000 of student debt, but they're only making like a hundred thousand dollars. Whereas a lot of your engineers, half of them didn't even need a computer science degree. They made Maybe they have a, a CS degree, maybe they don't. What they really need to know is JavaScript and Java or MySQL or some of the cloud technologies or stacks. And if you can do that, which you can learn online you're on yourself, then yeah, you probably have no student debt or very little student debt. If you have a CS degree, you might have, and it went to a really nice school like Stanford or Harvard or wherever, then yeah, okay, maybe you too 
have a hundred thousand dollars of student debt but you know usually the engineers do pretty well because they don't have the student debt and they still clear you know 120 to 150 thousand uh, fairly easily whereas your your nurses they're usually pretty high student debt and they don't make as much as the the engineers do until they get to the rn level and so that means you know six years of school plus a bunch of debt <laughs> to make a hundred and the hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year or so and they're hoping that they marry an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer someone who can you know really bring home a, a giant dual income so that you can you know go two three hundred thousand dollars of annual income and even attempt to try to pay off that student loan. Problem is, is that you're probably deep into your 20s, going into your early 30s uh, with a massive amount of debt that's only collecting interest, right? And so you're, you're and unless you got married, you're probably gonna want some kids, which means you're probably not gonna work so much, which means you can't afford to live in the city. So now you are gonna become a, a commuter, right? Because San Francisco, for instance, only has something like 700,000 residents but during the day there's 2.4 million people there on any given workday for jobs to work at a tech company or to uh, work at a hospital or one of the universities or some accounting firm or some law firm or whatever right so most people in San Francisco are actually commuters because they can't afford to live in the city even the engineers unless they're kids doing the apartment thing or doing the dorm style thing where they're, they're just renting a room. However, the moment they get married and they start having kids, then they move out and they quickly become commuters. Because of the student debt, <laughs> they're not paying off, they're, they're not making, they're not saving a whole bunch of money. If they bought a house, so now they're servicing like, you know, maybe a $500,000 mortgage in the East Bay, plus, you know, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of student debt. Maybe that's combined student debt. So now you got like six, seven hundred thousand dollars of debt that you're servicing with, you know, hopefully a dual income that exceeds 200 to 250 thousand dollars. Now, there's a lot of people who that's best case scenario, right? <laughs> a lot of people don't don't end up in the best case scenario. They end up in the worst case scenario where they have, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of combined student debt, married, couple kids, single income or maybe with stints of unemployment. That's what's really going down. And even if you were able to uh, keep your head above water, say like you bought a house and before the Great Recession, somewhere before 2008, 2007, and you bought a house, then you probably lost a couple hundred thousand dollars of equity due to deflation you know, as opposed to inflation. So this would be the inverse. And you had to kind of sit there until 2013, 2014, when the inflation in the bubble was reinflated through economic stimulus and quantitative easing while your neighbor <laughs> to your left or your right you know might have been sitting on you know the same house since the 70s or 80s who not only got the benefit of all that inflation you know long before the Great Recession but also had special tax laws passed in their favor like I think Prop 13 it was something like you didn't have to pay it limit how much they could tax your property to like 3% something equivalent to what they said inflation was so 3% annually was the most that they could increase your taxes. So if you bought a house in the in the 70s for $27,000 or $60,000, they couldn't, in, even though the houses today are going for like six, seven, eight hundred thousand, maybe a million dollars. If you're in Cupertino, somewhere near the tech giants, a million, two million, three million, they couldn't just keep increasing your taxes on that property. It can only be 3% annually off of the uh, $60,000 number. Whereas all the kids that are buying the house from the baby boomers, the millennials buying from the baby boomers, then they're paying 1.25% of their property tax on a million or $2 million number. <laughs> So, so it's almost like there's two sets of rules, one for people from the 70s and 80s and another one for all their kids. So all the kids got shafted because now they have to pay excessively high inflation rates or inflated housing costs, plus make a huge amount of money uh, coupled with massive student debts, which was also, the tuition was also inflated dramatically after 2000 as a result of the dot-com bubble. But then they also have to deal with the fact that <laughs> 
the, the tax laws are set up against them. And so a lot of kids are just like hopelessly desperate. They're just desperate and they're like, you know what? I want the state to forgive all my student loans. I want a more communist, Marxist kind of rhetoric coming out of their mouth. Right? I want the government to take care of me because obviously I can't take care of myself. I've made too many bad decisions or I've been sold too many bullshit loans I can't afford, let alone a house or a wife and kid. And you know, so this is why you see that Alexandria Cortez chick going around saying like, oh, hey, we, we, should, we should tax the rich. Yeah, fuck those assholes. Let's tax them 70%. And then she'll have this like crazy, you know, World War II, post-World War II communist rhetoric coming out of her mouth. It's like, you, you do realize that we fought several major world wars and a cold war and a whole shit ton of proxy wars over communism, right? And now you're going to come out and say, hey, you know what the solution to all these uh, double standards is more... <laughs> more government, right? Like the government put you into debt by subsidizing the student tuition. Uh, the government put you into debt by inflating <laughs> that the dollar thereby inflating the cost of housing and now the solution is more government of all things and of course over the last 20 30 years there's been all these special provisions put into the tax code in order to allow people with any jobs or businesses to actually run a business or to actually keep the jobs going through so they would create all the standard deductions in addition to business deductions or there's capital gains versus income tax so if you're running a business and the government wants more businesses to create more jobs in order to take care of the people and to pay more taxes, then they would give them all the loopholes. So even if they were in the Eisenhower days charging like the top tax rate of like 90 something percent, most of those people never paid that because their effective tax rate was never 90%. They would get it down to zero. <laughs> I mean, Apple, Google, Facebook, and friends has made an art of reducing the tax rate down to zero. Everything from the double Dutch Irish shuffle scheme, whatever they want to call it, to the Cayman Islands, to Swiss banks, where basically they would offshore profits or they would offshore their bank accounts or their assets, or they would create corporate entities to take the blunt or the blow of all the costs. And then they would pass through the, the income in the form of assets or dividends or whatever that gets ca that gets uh, taxed at the at the capital gains rate of like 10 or 15 percent. So then they never actually paid the 34 percent. They never actually paid the Eisenhower, you know, 90 percent rate, which Cortez is referring to by suggesting the 70 percent rate. So most people have never actually paid that high of taxes because of tax deductions. And so there's this massive hypocrisy in the tax code that says, yeah, we're tough on taxes and we're going to tax the rich. And this allows politicians to virtue signal. It even lets rich people, celebrities, virtue signal by saying, hey, I'm for higher taxes. I'm for robbing the rich and feeding the poor. <laughs> So yeah, woo, you know, let's let's increase the tax rate. Hey, if 90% is too high, let's let's do 100% because they don't actually intend on paying the tax. They intend on using all their deductions, creating corporate entities to offshore their profits and to hide any money that they do have. That's what they actually are doing or have been doing, which makes the tax code incredibly complex. So by the time 2013 came around, everyone was wise to this because they're like, well, why do we need a tax holiday for for corporations like Exxon or Chevron or Apple or Google. What, what 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 do you mean by tax holiday? It's like, oh, well, we've been storing all this money offshores, evading taxes, and we would like to bring that money home in order to invest it in business parks, property, the workforce, hire new people, build factories, uh, hire people to run the said factories, and, you know, uh, retreat from globalism so that they don't have to deal with the communist Chinese government. <laughs> and you know offshore their their factories in china or korea or japan or wherever right but in order to do that we need you guys to look the other way and say okay we know that you've been doing all this tax evasion for the last 10 20 30 years and that's why the middle class has been rotted out we need you to look the other way so we could bring the money home and start investing in uh, factories at home and start building our businesses back here in america which would complete the tax avoidance heist or the the bank heist right so by doing 
doing all these, implementing all these tax loopholes and then exercising the loophole and offshoring their profits, they were able to keep the money that should have gone to the government and then therefore be used to fund schools and police departments and fire departments and maintain our infrastructure. They get to keep it. Now they want to spend it and therefore they need the tax holiday in order to bring it home and spend it here as if they didn't just somehow avoid paying taxes for 20, 30 years. They want the public to give them permission or to call that money legal again. It was so bad, right? Where people were hunting down and saying like, how much money is over there? And which companies have it? How would that actually affect our current economy? And they weren't even terribly worried about the fact that they were committing crimes or an immoral crime, meaning that while they implemented tax loopholes into the law and then exercised the loopholes, makes it not illegal, but it doesn't make it legal either. Neither does it make it moral or ethical. But in my mind, it makes it really hard to respect them if they were cheating this whole time while everyone else has to play by the rules. Because those uh, pensions, all those uh, schools and uh, firemen and teacher police uh, pensions are going unfunded. All that infrastructure is rumbling anyway, which causes the government to borrow yet more money to inflate the currency or the dollar even more, which creates the wealth inequality problem. And I, I keep seeing this happening over and over where people are saying like, oh, well, we need to increase the taxes <laughs> in order to avoid the taxes. And, you know, virtue signal. They want to be seen as a virtuous person. Like I've even seen venture capitalists get up there and say, oh, the, the wealth uh, disparity, the income disparity the is due to too low of taxes. We need to raise the taxes because we can only buy so many blue jeans. We only need to buy five houses. And all that extra money is just sitting there. So why not tax me? You're like, yeah, the money is sitting there. Why don't you just write a check to your local school district? Or why don't you write a check to the treasury? I'm sure they'll be happy to take your money. But no, they need everyone uh, effective tax rate to be increased, provided that there's a loophole for them to extort or for them to create a corporation and offshore their profits and thereby avoid taxes themselves. Your libertarians or your Republicans or conservatives are always saying lower the tax rate. We want lower tax rate. We want smaller government. We don't want all this uh, insanity. And the tax code is insane. It's like a thicker than the Bible. Like you have to have an accountant or accountants in order to even to understand it. And even they don't understand it. They only understand, you know, uh, running their business and filing the paperwork. They don't actually understand the full extent of the tax law. They just know how to exercise the loopholes and take down the deductions in order to justify the cost of having an accountant or a tax person or a CPA or an EA or whatever. And by the way, really poor people do not have CPAs or EAs working for them. They might go to use TurboTax and not have any idea how how to actually, you know, exercise these loopholes or deduct all these deductions. And if they were making anything more than $15 an hour or 30, 20 or $30 an hour, they might go to H&R Block and then they'll just do the standard deductions. They're not like putting a dedicated team of people and resources to figure out how Apple can avoid all taxes everywhere, all the time, globally. <laughs> no, they're just going to some dude who's gonna file your paperwork for you and distance yourself from the headache of paying taxes or screwing with TurboTax. Even what's his face? Uh, Timothy Geithner, right? The guy from that was on the New York Fed who was then tasked with cleaning up the 2008 credit crisis and the whole housing bubble thing got tagged with using TurboTax <laughs> and filing improper uh, taxes with the, with the uh, IRS. And he, he blamed it all on TurboTax. You're like, really? Really, guys? But in 2013, as like in the wake of the 2008 credit crisis and the housing bubble and the everything bubble blowing up in everyone's faces was a lot of corporations were bailed out and people were furious that they had to be bailed out. And then they wanted to know where did all that money go and who got what and like, I don't know about you, but a lot of people wanted to see the CEOs of most of those uh, mortgage lending companies and the finance, Wall Street uh, banks and hedge funds and brokerages you know, go to jail, but nobody went. One of the more interesting things that came out of the 2008 credit crisis was the government was insisting on different corporations paying taxes. They even brought Apple's uh, CEO, Tim Cook, to Congress to testify about where Apple was hiding all their money. And in 
his testimony, he says, well, you know, listen, Steve Jobs, my predecessor, the founder of Apple, set up all these tax schemes to avoid taxes, A, because it was legal, but B, because it was necessary to be competitive with everyone else who was avoiding taxes. So if you didn't avoid taxes, you were somehow put at a disadvantage on a global state and you would lose. And then he touches on globalism, saying something similar is like, hey, you know, we can't move our factories from China back to the US because of the, the trade war or the tariffs that China imposes on uh, American made products into China, but the America does not tax goods made in China back to America. So he's like, well, that's one thing that needs to be addressed. The other thing that needs to be addressed is that China's effective tax rate, it was something like 20, 20%, whereas the US was like 34 or 35% for income. So even putting employees in the US was expensive compared to China or Korea or Japan or all these different places that were lowering their tax rates cheaper than the US in order to attract the, the global corporations to set up offices there. And that doesn't include the the Irish ones where they were like, oh, we're going to have an effective tax rate of zero. If you put your shiny headquarter here, I don't care if you employ you in here, we're going to help you avoid taxes in your prospective country. Just make sure you bribe your politician and tip your waitress on your way out so that we all have a Merry Christmas. So so Cook ta describes this a little bit and then he, he goes off and says, you know, if you really want to solve the problem, what you need to do is simplify the tax code and remove the deductions. So if there was no deduction, then rich people like celebrities, actors, millionaires, billionaires, whoever, and corporations can't avoid the taxes. Now, if you want to be competitive on a global stage and bring those jobs back, you're going to need to have a lower effective tax rate. So you need to be competitive with everyone else's tax rate. So in exchange for removing the tax deductions here at Apple, we suggest that you uh, lower the effective corporate tax rate and remove all the deductions so that there's no ability for them to avoid taxes. So in sum, he said, remove the deductions, simplify the tax code into a couple of tax brackets, one for personal income, one for corporate income, and lower the tax rate so that you're competitive globally. So in effect, you'll be able to bring all those jobs home, bring those factories home, bring those taxes home and collect the taxes. Furthermore, if you give us the tax holiday, we'll be more, we have, forget how many billions of dollars, he said it was like two or 300 billion, something crazy, some large number. He's like, we could just bring that in and start investing in it immediately. And by the time that Trump actually started running for president in 2015, or I guess as early as late 2014, Trump basically took, said, hey, I want to lower taxes. He didn't really define how he was going to do it, but he did say he was going to simplify the taxes. And then after going through a series of discussions, lo and behold, the Trump tax plan looks a hell of a lot like Tim Cook's 2013 congressional testimony. Hey, simplify the tax code, reduce the number of tax brackets, keep it simple, stupid, remove the deductions, lower the corporate tax rate, um, make it competitive with the world, give us a tax holiday to bring that money home and invest it. And subsequently, when Trump did the CEO board where he brought on like, you know, Apple, Tim Cook, uh, GE, Jeff Immel, Santia from Microsoft, and uh, I forget the other dude from Google, but brought and even Elon Musk from Tesla and SpaceX and brought in all these CEOs and say, said, hey, you know, let, let's get a working committee together and let's, you know, uh, let's address the whole tax issue. Uh, granted, there's a lot of infighting and a lot of people did or did not want to be seen with Trump at that time. But the net result was the, tr the 2017 Trump tax plan, where I think they were all basically in agreement that, hey, yeah, if you uh, lower the tax rate in exchange for removing all the deductions, that would achieve many of the goals that Apple Tim Cook was uh, saying in his 2013 testimony. So 2019, as we file our taxes this year, is the year to see if that's what is actually going down. I'm not sure how much the Republicans and Democrats changed the language of the tax bill that Trump signed into office, but 20, 2018 is the first year it goes into effect. And so we should be able to start looking at the net result of, of the 2018 taxes being filed in 2019. So we should, by the end of this year, have a pretty good idea. Did Trump's uh, tax plan or Apple Tim Cook's tax plan do as advertised? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, then please explain where it failed so that we can correct it.